really interesting subject. This is something that um, I get excited about at this time every year. We're going to learn today how to do winter sewing. So let me share my screen with you. And there we are. Yes, indeed, winters can be very long. And if we can believe anything that the Old Farmer's Almanac tells us, this winter, according to them, is going to be a rip snorter and we're gonna have plenty of snow. I don't know about you, but after the, the holidays are done and we move into January, I start to feel like there's something missing. And every year I say, I can't believe I am missing weeding and deadheading and planting stuff in my garden to watch it grow. And sometimes I even have planted seeds indoors. I've done that. Because I'm tired of just dreaming about what I can do outside when the weather is warm. I want to have a little taste of it indoors. So I got my seed planting flats out and I planted and I went from window to window to window trying to see that all my little seedlings had the best sunlight that I could possibly give them with what came in through the glass. It didn't always work out so well. Sometimes I had some spindly looking stuff that didn't look worthy to be in the garden. And then it came, the dreaded damping off. If you've ever planted seeds in the house in the winter and had damping off happen, you know what it can be all about. If we look up here in the right hand corner, we can see what plants look like when they have damped off. It's a fungus. It attacks your seedlings and they simply collapse. So that's some of the things that we have to deal with indoors when we plant seeds, unless we have a wonderful grow light set up. Some of you may have that. I personally do not. Um, so I am missing all of that good light. I don't have a sunroom where I can put seedlings. And then there's something else that you'll have to deal with when you plant seeds indoors in the winter. You have to think about how you're going to compute the length of time that it takes your seeds to sprout and add that to the length of time it takes your seedlings to mature, to get big enough and strong enough. And then you have to figure all of that out in relation to the last average date of frost in our zone. Here in zone five, it's about the middle of May. But judging from the last two springs that we've had, they were long, they were ugly, wet, cold, it even snowed. So nothing is written in stone for us. But the doctor is in. We have the cure. You'll have no more scarifying, stratifying, boiling water baths, grow lights, damping off, no more hardening off of plants. And for those of you who are newbies at gardening, hardening off means your plants need to be acclimated to outdoor living. We won't have to do any of that anymore. The best part of this technique is that even folks who are new to gardening can actually partake of this.
When we cook in the kitchen, when we make a recipe, the first thing that we do is to assemble our ingredients and assemble our utensils. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to figure out exactly what we need to winter sew. The first thing you can do is to retire your seed starting flats. That's right. You won't need them anymore. You won't need flower pots. You'll need what you already may have. If you take a peek in this in this uh, inset up here in the upper right hand corner, you can get some idea of the containers that you'll use for winter sewing. The best part is that you can reuse, recycle, and reduce waste by using containers like gallon jugs from milk or from water and two liter soda bottles. Those, are, those probably are the two favorite containers that folks who winter sew like to use. Instead of milk jugs and water jugs, I prefer vinegar jugs. Since I use um, maybe three gallons of vinegar in a year, I use it to clean with, I use it in every load of laundry that I do, I can accumulate those three jugs and they are more sturdy than milk or water jugs. The best part of that is you can reuse them for several years. Once you prepare them for your use, you can wash them out again, dry them, store them in a paper a grocery sack or in a, a bin, and I put them in a bin with a cover in my garage once they're clean and dry. They're all ready for me for the following year. You can also use carry-out containers, as, as we're seeing in this little inset up here. The, the uh, carry-out container needs to have a clear lid to let light in. Notice also in the photo, these little containers here. Sometimes we get them with soup as a carry-out or sauces. And I must, I must warn you ahead of time, if you're going to use them, they have to go into a larger container. Otherwise, if you have critters that visit your yard or the wind might take them, they need to be protected. You can use bowls like Cool Whip bowls. Even though they don't have a clear lid, I'm going to show you how to uh, adapt them for winter sewing. One of my all-time favorite things to use is a cake box. I bought a birthday cake and it came in a container that had a, a solid plastic bottom that was reinforced. It didn't bend. It was hard plastic. And then the dome on top was about six inches high. It made a perfect greenhouse that accommodated five styrofoam coffee cups. So if I didn't want a whole milk jug or or a soda bottle full of the same seed, I would have enough room to grow smaller amounts in those little containers. And you could see very easily when I wrote the name on the container uh, so that we knew what was in there. So again, be creative. This is a complete list of supplies that you will need to winter sew. Not a very long list, you have to agree. Of course, you'll need your containers that are thoroughly washed and rinsed. You don't want a, to use a milk container with um, dried milk in there or any kind of dried food in your containers. That would encourage uh, growth of bacteria or fungus, and we certainly don't want three strikes against us before we begin. The next thing you're going to need after the thoroughly washed, rinsed, and dried container is some quality potting soil. By quality potting soil, I don't mean that you have to go out and buy the most expensive potting soil or seed starting mix that you can find. Just don't go to the dollar store and buy soil. I've done that. I've, I've tried it out. And with that soil, I had nothing come up. I had zero, zero seedlings from that soil. I don't know what was in there. Um, 
but I will never use it again. I don't like to use the potting soil that, and it's a seed starting mix actually, it looks like tiny little bits of tan colored confetti. And it's very hard to moisten, it's full of static electricity. Um, you have to start several days ahead of time to moisten it. I don't care to use that. You may have a different experience, but I, I don't prefer that. The example that we have up here in the inset is a seed starting mix from a company called Gardener Supply. And I'm anxious to give that a try this year. It's got mycorrhizae in it. For those folks who don't know what mycorrhizae is, it's a beneficial fungus that works in a symbiotic way with plant roots. It's already out there in your garden already, but I'm wondering what this mycorrhizae will do to brand new seedlings. I'm hoping it will just give them a boost in the way of strength and vitality. Um, to explain to those of you who don't know what mycorrhizae is, it's a fungus, it lives in the soil, and it works hand in hand with the roots of plants. It helps them to absorb nutrients and water. It's a, as a fungus, it it's, can be ecto or endo. It can be on the outside of the roots or it can go into the roots. It can penetrate the roots. And that fungus then will send out its hyphae into the soil and it will collect water and nutrients and it will actually bring them to the roots of your plants. And in return, it's a symbiotic relationship. One hand washes the other. The fungus supplies water and nutrients to the roots of your plant, while your plant shares nutrients that it creates, the sugars that it makes during photosynthesis. And we know that funguses don't photosynthesize. They have no green plants on them. When you see a mushroom come up, it's not green. It doesn't have leaves. It doesn't make its own sugars. So this is a wonderful relationship that the mycorrhizae has with plant roots. As I said, it's in your garden already, but I'm anxious to see if it will indeed give my new seedlings extra vitality. So the potting soil or start, seed starting mix that you buy can have some fertilizer in it if you wish, but not the water retentive crystals that some potting soil has in it. That you don't want. A little fertilizer is okay. You'll also need a roll of good duct tape. Again, don't trot over to the dollar store and buy your duct tape. Buy some good duct tape that has good stickiness to it. It really needs to stick. And lastly, you'll need a permanent marker. So now that you've got everything, all you need are the seeds. What can you winter sow? Well, when I first heard about winter sowing, I found out that you can winter sow any seed that self seeds into you, in your garden. And I really didn't believe in the process. I had never used it and I doubted that it would work. And I had just gotten back from Walmart. Walmart had put out their seeds for the season and I found a packet of my favorite tomato. I was used to buying a couple of celebrity tomato plants. It's my favorite. They're small size, just right for me. And they, and they have tomatoes for a long time through the season. So, I thought this will be the acid test. Uh, you have to excuse the pun, I couldn't resist it. I figured that if I could grow tomato plants with winter sowing, I could grow anything. So I got my container ready. I put the soil in it, I moistened it. I was ready to sow my seeds. I took this, the packet of seeds and dumped the whole packet into my hand and I counted the seeds. I had 29 tomato seeds and I planted all 29 of them into a jug. Well, my friends, that spring, 
I was giving celebrity tomato plants to all my friends, to all my neighbors, to anybody who wanted a tomato plant because I had 100% of those seeds sprout. I had 29 celebrity tomato plants. I was sold. That was it. I was convinced. And I don't ever plant on my windowsill ever again. I use winter sowing. So you can plant anything that self seeds in your garden. You can plant any seed that requires what we call stratification or pre-chilling. You know how some folks, when they plant grass seed, they wanna stick it in their freezer for a time? That's stratification. You can plant any seed that is uh, that you see instructions on the packet that says plant this in the fall or plant it in late winter or early spring, that is fine in winter sowing. Any hardy seed that can withstand frost. You can plant annuals, perennials, biennials, even trees, bushes, the hardwood things, vines, herbs, and all your veggies. Now, if you have the capability on the device that you're seeing this on today, if you have the capability to do a screenshot, now's the time. If you're on a PC, you press the Windows key along with the screen print, the print screen key, and that will give you a screenshot of this slide. It should appear then in your pictures folder. If you're on a Mac, you will press Command, Shift, and the number three, and that will take a screenshot probably to your desktop. The reason I'm suggesting that you make a copy of this slide is it's something for you to go back on to check. If you forget how we explain how to do this, you will have a visual to explain it. So we're going to use as an example, a milk jug or a water jug. And we're gonna take our box cutter or our sharp paring knife. I prefer a box cutter, it's sharper. Some people use a hot nail or a hot screwdriver tip. Don't burn yourself, it gets very hot in order to melt through the plastic. So you're gonna make four or five drain holes. They're to drain excess water out of the container. So it has to be a hole, not merely a slit. If you push your, your um, box cutter into the plastic, give it a little twist, twist at, at your wrist to enlarge that hole. You don't want that slit to close up after you pull the box cutter out of there. So the hole that you're making is not in the underside, in the bottom of the, the jug. It's at the lowest point of the side of the jug. And you're gonna make those holes around the jug. Then you're gonna take a piece of duct tape, tape it to the bottom, to the underside of the container, and write down the seed that you're planting in there. In this case, it says cilantro. That's what I'm planting in that container. And it goes in the bottom, on the bottom of the container, on the underside in permanent marker. Next, you're going to mark up from the bottom of the container, you're going to mark up five inches. And you're going to mark five inches all the way around the container. With your box cutter, you're going to cut along that line. I like to use my kitchen shears, the kind that you can cut through chicken bones with. It, it, it makes fast work of cutting around. You're only going to cut on three sides of the container. Only on three sides. On the fourth side, you're going to create a hinge. You can see in the photograph how that top swings back. You can open it and close it. So to create the hinge, you're going to cut in from each corner on that fourth side you're gonna cut in a couple of inches, leaving maybe three inches or so uncut that will act as the hinge. We're moving right along. Now you can add soil to your container. 
the potting mix or the seed starting mix goes into the container, fill it to about a half inch from the top, and then tamp it down. You know, like when you, when you make a cake and you tap it on the counter to get rid of the air bubbles. If we tap this on the counter that we're working at, it will settle that soil in. Now you're going to moisten the soil just with water. We're not making mud pies here, guys. We're just moistening it so that it, it is ready to accept our seeds. Once you've moistened your soil, you take your packet of seeds and you're going to sow them on the top of that soil. Small seeds can just be scattered on the top. If you wish, you may cover those seeds with a fine layer of soil. You really don't need to, but you may if you feel more confident that you're going to get good soil contact. Then you're going to take your hand and pat the seeds onto the soil to ensure good contact with the soil. And then if you wish, you can spray them in a, with a fine mist of water just to, to give them a final kiss goodbye. If you're planting bigger seeds, like say Delichos Lab Lab, a bean type seed, you're going to just poke it into the soil so that it, the end of that bean type seed is even with the top of the soil level. And then sprinkle lightly with soil and mist with a little water. The last thing you will do is swing back that lid into its original position and with a small piece of duct tape, secure it in place so that you can tape it securely with a long strip of duct tape that's going to go all the way around your container. And with your hands, press the tape onto the container so that you get a good adherence of that tape. It must be stuck in place securely very well. It's going to be there for a while. This is how you prepare a bowl that has a lid that you can't see through. First of all, you're going to make some drain holes in that bowl near to the bottom. It's going to be on the side of the bowl, but near to the bottom. It can't just be a slit, it's got to be a little hole. Now, the lid, you're going to mark with your marker an inch away from the edge, all the way around that top, and then you're going to cut out that top. So for those of you who are needlework people, what you're going to have is something that looks like an embroidery hoop. After you've planted your seeds in the soil, in the bowl, and prepared them properly, you're going to take a piece of plastic film like saran wrap, glad wrap, and cover the lid, or excuse me, cover the surface of that bowl. Just stretch, just like you were going to prepare a leftover to go in the fridge. You're going to cover that bowl with plastic wrap and then snap on that little lid that has been adapted. So you can see what, you're, what you've got. You've got a bowl that's covered with saran to allow the light to come in. And then you're going to take your box cutter and put four slits, just slits, not holes, four slits in the plastic film. And then you can adjust that, that film. You can tighten it up just like you would the cloth in, a, in an embroidery hoop. Just give it a little tug. And, and give it some tension on the top. So this is your um, last uh, step. You've prepared your container, you've planted your seeds, everything is good to go. The last thing you do is put on your coat and your boots and your hat, put all your containers that you've planted into a box or a bin and carry them outside. And there they are. These are some that I had planted several years ago. 
Um, and remember, I am in a duplex, so my yard is very small and I don't need a whole lot. I'll get a lot out of what I have planted here. If you go online and look up winter sowing, you're gonna see folks that have maybe 50 containers all planted up with seeds. And so many of those folks do use um, milk or water jugs and uh, soda, uh, two liter soda containers. Um, in this example, these containers are out in the, in the winter, in January, in the snow. Oh my gosh, they're gonna freeze, you say. Yes, my friends, they will freeze. And they might thaw, you say. Indeed, they, they will thaw. And then they're going to freeze again. And the freezing and thawing is Mother Nature's way of cracking open the seed coat on the seeds so that when it comes time, they can sprout. The, the freezing and thawing is a necessary part of what's going on. Now, the last thing that you do when you set your containers outside, if you're using jugs like this, is to take the cap off them and recycle it. Because the cap being gone, the slits in the top of every other container that you have planted is going to allow the admission of snow into those containers so that when it melts, you have your container watered. And in the spring, when we have rains, the water can come into the, into the container to keep your seeds in a moist medium. We moistened the seeds when we, we moistened the soil when we planted the seeds. And that should last until winter is done and it starts to rain. The snow will melt and water them. The rain will come and water them. In the winter, your only job with those containers outside is to come outside every week or two and check to see that there's condensation on the middle of on the inside of the the containers if you see con the containers with condensation inside you can be assured that the containers are moist enough to carry your seeds through to germination if there is no condensation on those containers, even if they're out in the sun, then you will have to carefully trickle a little water into a container that has no condensation. You'll tip the container on its side and you'll carefully put a trickle of water down the side. You don't wanna put that container under the faucet and put a gush of water in there to wash away your seeds and make mud inside. You don't want to do that. That's why I suggest that you carefully trickle a little water down the side of the container. If, you're, if you do a good job of moistening when you're planting, not making mud, but moistening when you're planting, then if it snows enough in the winter and it's cold enough, the moisture that you put in there at planting time will last but you do need to keep an eye on the little buggers. Where you place your containers is another consideration. These that are off my back porch are on a northern exposure because I don't have much choice. If I put it on the west and south side, my house is on an angle um, according to the compass, those seeds would, would germinate too quickly for me to be able to plant them in my nasty clay soil. And we know that if we work our soil too soon, you can actually ruin your soil. It becomes compacted and ugly and you don't want to, um, to use it if it's in that condition. So if I put the seeds on the south or west side, they're gonna sprout too soon for me. I can't put them on um, the south side, the real south side, because that's where my duplex mate has her exposure. Um, the east side is no go because it's on a hill and I'm afraid that they, the, my containers would tumble down the hill. And the other remaining side is where the wind comes through like a wind tunnel between my house and my neighbor's house. 
the wind just blows through like it's, it's no tomorrow. So that's not an option. So as soon as the worst part of winter is open, I'm, uh, is over, I move these containers away from the back porch and get them out more into the grand scheme of things. But it's not a big deal to move them. And so once every week or two, going out and peeking to check for condensation means that you will have some spare time this winter. So choose a color that you like because you'll be sitting by the fire, warm and toasty, knitting your sweater. And when spring comes, you will have your nose out in those containers, checking to see what's coming up. This is a picture right down the neck of the, of the milk jug, and it shows my first sprouts. They have um, their first leaves, and some of them are getting, indeed, they're getting their true leaves. Now you get to learn from my mistakes, folks. Sometimes you don't want to fill a milk jug completely with one kind of seed. So I will divide my milk jug visually in two and plant two different seeds. In this jug, I planted marigolds on one side. And on the other side, it was something that took a bit longer to sprout, maybe morning glories, if you've ever grown morning glories from seed, you know how long it takes for them to sprout. It seems to take forever. You soak them, you scarify them. Scarifying them is nicking the seed in some way. Some folks on big seeds use sandpaper. Some people use um, fingernail clipper to put a little clip in it. But if you do that with the fingernail clipper, keep in mind the fact that under that seed coat that you're trying to snip lives a baby plant. It's an embryonic plant in there. And if you damage it while you're trying to scarify it, it probably won't sprout. So um, say, for instance, I did have morning glories on the other side of the marigolds. And the marigolds have already sprouted, and they're going to start to get their true leaves. And they're going to grow into little baby plants before that morning glory even sprouts. And it will, they will tend to crowd out anything on the other side. Thank goodness the morning glories are vines and they can crawl away and get sun on their own. But you want to keep in mind, if you're planting two different seeds in the same container, be mindful of the time that it takes to germinate each seed. You need to pick seeds that have similar germination times. If one has 10 day germination time according to the seed, seed packet, or if you look online, you can always find germination times online. The, the second seed that you plant should have something similar, something similar within a couple of days of, of each other. Otherwise you run into problems. Okay, here's another mistake friends. Um, a buddy of mine gave me poppy seeds. The seeds from these poppies was smaller than the kind you use in baking, about a fourth the size. So <laughs> I planted them and they were, they were black, of course, and I couldn't see them against the dark soil and I overplanted. I got them too close together. What I should have done was mix them with a couple of tablespoons of sand, and the sand is gonna be a lighter color, like beach sand, and I'll put it, I should put it into an envelope and cut just a bit of the corner off that envelope so I could carefully sprinkle the seed and sand over the surface of my um, soil so I could see what I was doing and I wouldn't have overplanted them, I wouldn't have overseeded. But all is not lost. When these seedlings reached the, the size with true leaves that I could plant in my garden, I turned that whole clump of soil out onto my counter. Right side up, of course. You know, you turn it over on your hand and then flip it back so it's right side up, just like you would a, a cake out of a pan. And then you take a sharp knife 
and you make vertical cuts an inch apart and cross them with horizontal cuts an inch apart. Now you have one inch plugs that you can plant in your garden. So all is not lost. And something um, that you wanna keep in mind when you're planting your seeds, some seeds need light to germinate, like celery and some lettuces, um, some annuals like snapdragons. So do not cover them. Sow them on the top of the soil, pat them in, gently pat them to make good soil contact give them a little misting of water and you're done with that. Remember, some seeds need light to germinate. And, and I have to tell you, the reason I wanted to save these seeds was the first time when they bloomed, I planted them right behind some electric blue um, Veronica and the combination of the pink and blue was very striking. The best part was a couple of years later, they did self-seed. They, they came to be hugely double, fully double and then some. I mean, they looked like this. They looked like a peony. They weren't just single cup-shaped poppies that we're used to seeing. They were wonderful and marvelous. And that's why I wanted to save these seeds and, and have more of those uh, super double plants. Now, this is one of the cups that came out of the cake box. Um, again, learned by my mistakes. Um, when they were taken out of the cake box, I was so thrilled that they were looking so well. Um, I set them down on the porch and I walked away. I went into the house to get a container to put them in. And when I came back out, they had blown away. The styrofoam is light. And the, the potting mix, the, the seed starting mix was quite light and it was a windy day and I ended up running into my neighbor's yard chasing them. Uh, they, nothing was lost because the soil was wet enough to stay in the pot, um, in the cups, but um, always have your container ready to go <laughs> to put small containers in when you're going to allow them to be out in the sun and the wind. If they haven't been in the sun while they're in their containers sprouting, carefully acclimate them to sunlight if they're sun-loving plants. If they're shade-loving plants, leave the babies in the shade. Um, the reason that you take them out in the spring, you want them acclimated to the breezes, to the spring breezes. What that spring breeze does is to strengthen the stem so that they're strong and robust. And when it comes time to plant them in your garden, they can stand alone out there. They won't be in a cup or a pot, uh, a, a container where they're so crowded that they hold each other up. They're going to get some wind, some breeze to strengthen them. And they're gonna get the sunlight to enable them to grow, to synth photosynthesize and make their own food. If you planted seeds in a, um, a medium that didn't have fertilizer in it, that seed is going to supply its own nutrients for a short time. And when you plant them in the garden, they will get more. These seedlings happen to be from a plant, an annual called nigella. And after, when I looked at this again this year, when I was uh, updating this, this uh, presentation, I realized how much I like nigella. Another name for it is love in a mist. And the flowers are up here in the corner. Some of them are double, some of them are single. Um, the the uh, foliage looks kind of like dill. It's a very fine foliage, hence the name love in a mist. And the flowers themselves are so cool. The reproductive parts in the center of the flower are intricate delicate looking things like, like you've never seen before. Sorry if I sounded political there. Um, and some of, the, some of the flowers, the reproductive parts are, they're, they're blue, the color of sapphires. Uh, it's hard to describe what they look like. They're just absolutely gorgeous. So um, should you want something that kind of looks like uh, a bachelor button, but not, 
Um, it's far more intricate. The little bushy plant grows to be about a foot and a half uh, wide and tall. And when you see that plant growing, you know why it's called Love in a Mist. It is a cool season annual. It likes spring and early summer. As soon as it gets hot outside, the flowers develop seed pods that are really interesting. And if you cut them at ground level and hang them upside down, like in your garage in a warm place that is airy, um, they make wonderful uh, additions to um, uh, dried bouquets. Now, it's spring, your seeds have sprouted, you've got tiny little seedlings. What you're going to do in spring to the plants that are in like your Cool Whip bowls, you're gonna take your box cutter and enlarge those holes that admitted rain and snow in the winter. You're gonna enlarge them. Put your box cutter in, give it a twist. And you're gonna do that every couple of weeks um, or, or actually weekly rather than every couple of weeks, every five to seven days. You're gonna do that until the holes are greater than the amount of plastic wrap. You can then take the plastic wrap off and that's what will expose your plants to the air, the spring air, the spring breezes. When it comes time to plant in the ground, you're going to, of course, plant them carefully, water them in, and you are not going to fertilize them at that time. You're going to wait 10 days. After 10 days, you'll give them a 25% solution of fertilizer. You might want to screenshot this slide as well to give you um, something to remind you of what to do. For example, if your fertilizer package says, put four teaspoons of this in a gallon of water, for a 25% solution, you'll only put in one teaspoon. So after 10 days from planting time, you're going to fertilize with a 25% solution. Then wait two weeks. Then you'll fertilize with a 33% solution. You'll use only a third of the full amount of fertilizer per gallon. Wait two weeks, then 50%. After two weeks more, 75%. After two weeks more, you're at full strength fertilizer. By that time, it is summer and your plants are looking absolutely wonderful. Um, this little seedling illustration down here in the corner, it reminds me to, to let you know that when a seed sprouts, and, and again, a, an example of those big bean-like seeds, because they're easier to see, if you see those sprout, you'll be aware that the first thing that comes out of that seed is a root. So that when you are planting, you need to be aware of that. Once the, the root starts to get into the soil and it's absorb, absorbing moisture, it gets, it's getting a drink, then out the top comes your actual green plant gets the new true leaves first and, in, and it keeps on growing. If you plant that seed too deeply into the ground, the seedling cannot find its way up through all that soil to get out. And your seed may very well have sprouted, but you've planted it too deeply for it to, to emerge from the, the surface of the soil and then it will die. Okay, here's what happens when you either forget to label your container or you use a marker that is not waterproof and it washes away or the sun bleaches out permanent markers so you can't quite make out what the name is. Uh, and by the way, I don't write names on my, on my containers. I write numbers and I keep a sheet in the house with the numbers corresponding to the correct name 
and then any other notes I can write on that sheet of paper that I will use in succeeding years. If there's something special that I need to remember about that plant, I can write it on that sheet. So you, you've got your snoot down inside a milk jug because something's sprouting in there, but you have no idea what it is. You can go online and you can find uh, tables like this that have pictures of sprouts. The first leaf, the, the first then true leaves after that, like for instance, here we have a carrot and here we have a tomato. Um, here we have some celery and you can find those online if you make a mistake and either don't label your, your container or your label for whatever reason disappears. And where are you gonna get your seeds? If you've saved them from previous year on your, uh, uh, in your, from your garden, you can save those. Um, a friend of mine has saved for many years seeds from her dear mother. She saved them in her freezer and she used those little uh, desiccant um, envelopes that you find in vitamins or prescription meds. She put those into the container with the seeds and she saved her mama's seeds for many years. And that was kind of a, a cool thing to do. Uh, and when you're storing seeds, you want to store them. If you're not freezing them, store them in a cool, dry place in paper in an envelope in the original seed packet, but in paper. If you store them in a plastic bag, in a Ziploc bag, they may um, have a certain amount of moisture in there and that can produce a fungus and you don't want to do that. If you're going to um, get your seeds from another place, I personally am missing the Porter County gardening show that happens, that extravaganza every January. And I used to get all my seeds from the Seed and Bulb Exchange. I would bring some and get some. Um, and it was a wonderful thing. That's where I found my first nigella seeds. And that's where I found um, Renee's garden. I got my first packet of seeds from Renee's garden. And it was this very seed that I got from the Seed and Bulb Exchange. Um, if you read what it says on the packet, it says long pastel green, juicy, ridged fruit with a mild flavor. They're also car called yard long cukes and they are, <laughs> they are huge. And that was the first time I had ever grown them. I grew them on my arbor um, in one of my beds and they are indeed pastel green colored, a very soft green which by the way, happens to be my favorite color anyway, but be that as it may, um, they were so well concealed on the arbor that I couldn't see them. I, I would walk past and, and see if I saw any, any seedlings or, or any little cukes on there. And I didn't until one day I was anxious. I went to the, to the vine and I started digging through the vine and there was a foot long Armenian cucumber. And I panicked. I thought, oh my gosh, did I let this grow too long? So I read the seed packet. No, 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 I didn't let it get too big. I brought it in the house and, and the, the surface, as you can see in the drawing on the seed packet, the surface is ridged and the skin is very smooth and it's very thin. It's digestible. Um, it's kind of like the burpless cucumber thing. Um, they're, they're very easily digestible. So I cut both ends off and I ran it through my Cuisinart on shred and I put it into a bowl and added some plain yogurt and some garlic and a little bit of lemon juice. And it, it, it was so tasty. It, it, was like, it was like tzatziki sauce, the Greek sauce that you can eat. I ate the whole darn bowl. It was delicious. So um, that's how I became acquainted with Renee's garden seeds. They're wonderful seeds. Um, and all of these four links that I've put on here for you that you might want to take a screenshot of um, take you to places that sell reliable seeds. The seed, the, the um, 
the uh, link to the to the site the site is super super good it's not just telling you i have this seed this seed and this seed it gives a whole lot of other useful information some of the seeds have um, sample garden plots to show you examples of how you might plant things um, it had a lot of them have other um, supplies that you'll use um, uh, seed starting soil and so forth the the top one of course is renee's garden wonderful seeds prairie moon the second one right here prairie moon deals in native seeds native plants and seeds they do sell plants as well prairie moon prairie moon moon is focusing on native plants and seeds because those of us who have gardened for a little bit are very aware of planting natives in our gardens for diversity in nature. Um, that's a whole other story for another presentation, but um, trust me, natives is, you know, they are the way to go. I don't say to plant your, your gardens in only natives because like that nigella that is not a native and i love it and i have to grow some every once in a while just to satisfy my nigella um, uh, jones uh, the last two links go to tried and true old-fashioned brands this one of course is burpee this one i had to shorten the url because it was three lines long and too cumbersome this one is for park seeds and just like the other two sites they don't just sell seeds they give you wonderful useful information and you can buy other supplies there if you so desire so those are some places to get seeds and now that you know everything that there is to know about winter sowing should you have a question we'll call on our on our commentator, our host, hostess, Peyton, to check out the chat box and see if we have some um, questions. Peyton? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can either leave it in the chat or unmute yourself now. I do have a couple comments in the chat. Um, the love in a mist dry beautifully for arrangements and yep. when you make that sheet with your numbers to keep to identify what you planted for later reference take a screenshot of it, of it and save it to your computer so just some comments yeah really good that's a great idea then you'll you never lose it unless you forget where you saved it like i do <laughs> any other questions or anything oh the best time of year to winter sow? Question. <laughs> I try to get them in by the end of January. The snow's on the ground and you're assured of the freezing and thawing. Um, people who have been doing this technique for years have said that if you plant any earlier then the winter solstice, the 21st of December, you can run into problems. It's, it's just not, it's just simply too soon. Some people have um, uh, a procedure that they go through. It's like, it's like a, a, a process every year. It's a, a remembrance. They do plant some things on the winter solstice. They plant woody things like trees and bushes, woody plants uh, at that time so that they can be in soil for a longer, longer time. And because again, they're woody plants, but I myself don't plant any later than the end of January. You can plant uh, further along in the season, but don't go too, too close to planting time. I mean, because then it's pretty useless. It, it doesn't make any sense to, to winter so if you're not, planting things in the winter um, you might as well just go ahead and plant them in the garden if they can withstand the cold ground and if your if your soil is warm enough um, if you if you forget some seeds and i have done this if you forget some seeds 
um, in your, your winter sewing process and all of a sudden it's April and you realize you have these seeds to plant. Uh, another master gardener friend of mine has given me uh, another tip and, and this works. I only did it once and I made it a point after that not to forget to plant any seeds. But um, get your seed starting flat, flat back out again and put your st starting mix in it. Plant your seeds and then take them into your bathroom <laughs> and open the registers full out. And if you have a, uh, a space heater, crank it up. You want it to be 80 some degrees in that bathroom. Turn out the lights, shut the door. Keep checking on it so that everything is all okay. But you're, you're heating up that room like it was summer. And believe it or not, within 24 hours, 99% of your seeds are going to sprout. I don't like to do it. It makes me nervous having that, that space heater in there. As I said, I only did it one time, but it does work. And if you have a, a heating mat, that's probably better. A heating mat is a, it's like, um, it's like a hot water bottle for your plants, uh, for your seeds. It's, it's um, like a heating pad. It's electric. You plug it in and set your flat on top of it. And that uh, encourages your seeds to sprout more quickly. So that is, that is the, the last. And, if, and you can try this. If you have seeds um, that you want to plant ooh, by the end of March, beginning of April, and those are things that are, um, they're, they're not the, the cold hardy ones. They're the things that, that will sprout in, in warm weather. Um, you can try it in there. It does, a lot of people do that. I personally just wait until spring and, you know, pass the frost date and plant them direct into the ground. All right, thank you. We do have a few more um, comments and questions. So Larry just says, thank you for the excellent presentation. Valerie says, thank you. She found it very interesting. Um, Dora says, would stick labeling inside the containers be helpful if you lose the bottom label? Um, there, uh, if you, yeah, if you have it on, you know, uh, some people use little mini blind slats as markers to put in plants. They cut them into six inch lengths and then they stick them in the, in the pot and label them with, with what they've got planted. That is a fine idea if you'd like to do that. Great. And but, then, oh, you know, keep, keep in mind if you, if you're planting in a cool whip bowl, you know, that doesn't give you a whole lot of room. So you're going to have to stick it way down into the soil and, and only cut your, your piece of plastic um, short enough so that you can cover your container. Okay. And then we have, in the past, if I planted seeds indoors, the stem is so wimpy. Well, that's what happens when they don't get enough sun. They don't get enough light, that's going to happen. And that's why we, when we plant for winter sowing, we plant in a container where the light can come in so that you don't have those spindly, leggy plants. And if you don't have a grow light and you're planting inside, you're going to have those leggy plants that aren't strong um, uh, enough to stand alone in your garden. The, the technique that I told you about using a heat mat or a hot bathroom to, to plant seeds that you have forgotten about, that's what you need to do with them. As soon as the temperature outside reaches 40 degrees, the things that you have started inside need to come outside. You need to acclimate them to the cooler temperatures outside. Remember, 40 degrees is cold enough for a coat outside. So you're going to bring them out very slowly, a half an hour for a couple of days in a row, then 45 minutes for a couple of days in a row, then an hour for a couple of days in a row until you're not going to harm the plant by the cold air. And then you're going to let the, the wind breezes, not a gale, breezes, try to strengthen those leggy plants. It may work, it may not. They may be just too leggy to withstand it. 
All right. And then we have another comment. Um, I, I was a little confused as to where to put them, sun or no sun. Um, when you put them out, you can put them in the sun. If you have a spot in, in your yard, um, I put them on the north side where they don't get as much sun, but they do need sun. They, they really do. They need the light. Um, but watch them when, um, when they uh, become seedlings, when they have true leaves and they become seedlings and you take them, um, take the lid off your jugs or pull, you know, pull the lid back so that they can get some sun. Watch out for that sun if you've got shade loving plants like for instance, um, um, toad lily. Um, those are shade loving. They can only tolerate a small amount of sun. So you don't wanna burn the babies when, when you just take the lid off them. Be mindful of strong sun. And I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but I surely have. The sun anymore is very strong. In the summer, it, it blazes and I, I just had, my dear Japanese maple that is I've had ever since I've been in this house, I had to take it down because um, the little bit of sun that was getting to it every day, and, it, and it's been here for almost 20 years, and it never bothered it before, but the last three years, the hot sun has taken its toll on that tree, and I had to have it removed. So be mindful of the hot sun on your baby plants. And then just some comments. I'm inspired to try. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'll give this a try this winter. And thank you for a very informative presentation. Well, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here um, for Gabus at Purdue Northwest. Um, and thank you, Peyton, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Of course, it. of course. Um, let's see. I think those are all the questions. Um, we will be sending this out. So if any other questions come up, um, I would be happy to send them to Victoria. Just email the Gavis Arboretum email and we'd happy to do that. And thank you again for everyone joining us um, today on this Saturday and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. It was my pleasure. All right, everyone have a great day. Bye, Victoria. <laughs> Bye, Peyton.